Hi, this is Iftach, and I want to tell you about two things I did this summer. First being renovating a hundred-year-old house in the Lake District north of Berlin, which is a long-term project. And the second one was learning a ton of data science. So my story with data science starts sometimes in 2022 when I was invited to take part in a research project for the University of Bonn, the Institute for Musicology and Sound Studies, titled Syncopated Modernity on the Conception of Sound as Temporalized Entity. And the topic was timing and microtiming in piano rolls from the beginning of the 20th century. And my role was to write a piece of software that will perform analysis on a big batch of roles and would draw some conclusions. And I did it using Max and Ableton. And if you know me, you know that I love Max. It's my favorite programming language. Since I was planning of doing more of this, I thought it's a good idea to invest in learning the proper tools. So I took a really deep plunge into data science and learned a bunch of Python and SQL and methodology and the theory behind it and the history behind it. And this was pretty surprising because I realized that I came in learning it as a, as a way to expand my toolkit. And I really became passionate about it. I mean, I am equally passionate about data science as much as I'm passionate about music technology, which is something that I've been doing, I don't know, for the past 20 years. And I'm really, really, really looking forward to combine both. So moving on, the reason I'm doing this video is that I want to share a notebook I did called Exploratory Data Analysis of FX Twins Music Using Spotify Metrics, aka Understanding Spotify Metrics through the music of FX Twin. The reason I did this notebook is A, for practice reasons, and B, because I think it's pretty darn interesting to look into these things. The notebook is uh, available for download. I'll leave a link to my GitHub down below. My plan was just to walk through this notebook with you and explain what I did. So the initial dataset was compiled using Spotify's API, uh, and I basically grabbed everything they offer. I think it's like 15 features or something. I don't have it in mind. And there's some like basic stuff like track ID, popularity, BPM, duration. But then there's all these interesting attributes such as densibility, energy, speechiness, acousticness, instrumentalness, violence, and so on. And these are the ones I really wanted to look into. I mean, I wanted to understand how they perform and I wanted to see what I can do with them. So the first one I've looked into was Densibility. So I basically arranged the data frame to show the top densible tracks. And I was pretty surprised by the results because the most densible track according to Spotify's metric of FX Twin in Spotify is number eight from Selected Ambient Works Volume 2, which is, uh, I mean, I, I can probably not play you the tracks in the background, but I do leave uh, links to playlists that I compile uh, during this notebook. So check it out in the description below. So if you do know FX Twin, you know that number eight is definitely not something that you would define as the most danceable FX Twin track. Reading the description of Spotify, they say that Danceability describes how suitable a track is for dancing based on a combination of musical elements including tempo, rhythm stability, beat strength, and overall regularity. And the scale is zero to one. If you do know this track, you know that there's basically just a drum loop going from the beginning to the end, and it's very prominent. And I guess this is why Spotify detects it as very danceable. So I raised the question, is this the sole presence of drums enough? Of course, my answer is no, because what defines danceability is more than just drums or more than just regularity of drums. The next track, Cow Cut is a Twin, supports this idea that this is how they calculate densibility because it's another case of a drum beat that is very prominent, it's a very short loop and it just goes along the whole track. However, on the other side of the spectrum, densibility seems to do a good job representing tracks which are not danceable. Okay, I, I don't want to say that you cannot dance to ambient music, each to their own. However, it seems that it does a pretty good job detecting tracks with extremely low densibility. I guess it's easier to judge something as non-densible because there's no drums on the background than it is to judge how densible something is when you look only into the presence of drums and repetition and regularity as they do. So the next thing I've looked into was energy. And again, they tell us that it's a measure from zero to one and it's comprised from dynamic range, perceived loudness, timber, onset rate, and general entropy. Okay, also here we get some mixed results. According to Spotify, the most energetic track is Headfilm, which is a 
track I really love and it does have a certain energy, but I would personally rather categorize it on the ambient side. Moving on, I looked into Valence, which according to Spotify is a metric that measures how positive or happy a track sounds, with a score ranging from 0 to 1. And lower scores supposedly mean that the track sounds sad or angry, while higher scores mean it sounds happy or cheerful. Okay, uh, the result of Valence is pretty interesting. I, I understand why Funny Little Man scores high. It's kind of a very weird track. I wouldn't call it necessarily happy or positive. It's just weird and has this very quirky energy. But it's very surprising for me to see the next track. Sorry, some tracks are just unpronounceable. It's rather very thoughtful or pensive. It's definitely not something that I would categorize as cheerful or happy or whatever. My point is that these metrics are kind of useful, but they don't really capture what I'm looking for. I feel that either they're made to walk with a really broad sense of music or they're made to be used to engineer bigger features and this is what I wanted to do. So I came up with two features. The first one called, sorry for the lack of better terms, bangerness and it should measure how likely the track would work on very intensive dance floors. And the second one is ambientness which would evaluate how ambientish track is but not just by the lack of uh, a drum beat a little bit more so the next thing i did was exploring the correlation with the heat map because it's very visible you can immediately see what correlates to what things that immediately jumped to my eye was obviously the very strong connection between loudness and energy with a very high score of zero point almost 0 0.9 and then uh, violence and densibility and loudness and valence and then also negative correlation between acousticness and energy and acousticness and loudness which kind of makes sense but also what i found really interesting and pretty self-explanatory when you think about it is that release year and loudness are correlated so we need to factor that in if we think about bangerness i'll explain why in a second so there's two reasons for this. I think that uh, releases that came out after 2014 were like way less ambienty or like beat driven stuff such as Cyro. Secondly, if you've been into the audio world, you must have heard of the term the loudness wars, meaning things inherently became louder, mastering processes became louder, compression is more vastly used. So we need to factor that in because Loudness is playing a very big role with energy and energy plays a very big role with how banging a track would be, so we need to compensate for this. So the next thing I did was to plot loudness versus release year. It reveals a small yet noticeable trend in loudness, which is like 0.3 dB a year, something like this. So yeah, as I explained, since loudness influenced the energy metrics, new releases may appear more banging due to modern mastering techniques and mastering standards. Spotify also includes some reissues which have been remastered and we want to avoid bias when defining bangerness towards the new releases because there are many, many banging tracks from the beginning of the 2000s or the 1990s. So uh, yeah, we should compensate for this. So to calculate bangerness, I use energy, valence, sensibility and negative acousticness. And and loudness is adjusted to have more influence on older tracks. So for the loudness adjustment, I use the coefficient which resulted from the loudness versus release year, which is 0 0.29 or 0 0.3 dB. And the baseline year would be 2001. The reason I chose 2001 is just that it's the release of Brooks, which is very, very varied in terms of loudness. So I think it's a good place to start. So if we now rearrange the data frame to show the top banging tracks according to my calculation, we see things which for me musically pretty much make sense. Of course, it's uh, it's only my opinion, but uh, you can judge for yourself. I made a playlist um, of the top 10 most banging tracks according to my calculations, uh, which you can listen to. I leave a link down below. Yeah. So moving on, short interlude before moving to ambientness, I wanted to check for popularity, and the analysis below shows a slight decline when bangerness increases, which, okay, I mean the mean square error is very high, it will probably do very bad in predicting, but the overall trend still offers some useful insights, in my opinion, and it indicates that tracks with higher bangerness don't always become more popular, obviously, as, um, we talk about Spotify, not in the outside world, don't always become more popular. And uh, this aligns with my hunch that Spotify is often used for background music, which might explain why more energetic or demanding tracks are not really as popular. 
because they won't find their ways into some kind of playlist called uh, 10 tracks to study and focus on a rainy day, for example. I want to confirm this idea of mine, so I'm looking into the 10 most popular tracks of FX Twin in Spotify, and the results are pretty much supporting this theory because it's all very beautiful, very ambient tracks, which I personally love also. Um, but they do suggest that although the mean square error is very high, there is some kind of support to the idea that banging tracks are less popular. On a short note, I was really curious to know why QKTHR, another unpronounceable track, you all know the drill. Um, why is it so popular? I mean, it's beautiful, but how come this is the most popular track on Spotify? And it turned out that it appeared on some kind of a vague TikTok trend sometimes, which, uh, yeah, made it, pushed it up the charts. Um, after this, we see usual suspects such as Avril 14th and Rabarb and Extal and so forth. So after checking this, I got kind of curious because I see a pattern there in the popular tracks. Obviously, it's, most of it is ambient-ish, very melodic, very musically compelling, beautiful tracks. So I did another correlation matrix looking into what correlates with popularity and um, it seems that energy, acousticness, and instrumentalness, and violence are the most significant factors. The analysis shows that uh, the top tracks have generally low energy, high acousticness, high instrumentalness, and violence is kind of all over the place. Scientifically, it confirms my hunch that ambient is definitely the most popular, and it also supports my other theory that these tracks are making their way more easily to some kind of very generic playlists. Except of being also beautiful tracks, which I also love to listen to. So next up, I wanted to calculate ambientness, which is the second feature I came up with. And to calculate the ambient score, I inverted the scale for energy and sensibility, so that lower values have more positive impact. Then I combined these actual values with acousticness and instrumentalness and did some weighting. And the resulting data frame uh, sorted by ambientness looks like this. Um, we can see that most of the tracks are actually from either selected ambient works, volume two or Drooks. You can judge it by yourself. I made another playlist. I think the results are pretty nice. So the next thing I did was to run a single linear regression between ambientness and bangerness. And it shows an R score of 0.92, which is very high. So that means there's a strong link between them. And the mean square O is also very, very low, like 0.006 or something. So it means that the model, should there be one, is quite accurate and it tells me that bangerness does a good job predicting ambientness and that the model is capturing most of the variation of both, which is nice. Which then in turn made me wonder, I mean, Apex Twin has these really, really banging tracks and has these really, really, really ambient tracks and sometimes they meet and these are my favorite tracks. And I wondered what happens when bangerness meets ambientness when they share very similar values. So what I did is I filtered the tracks to find those where the scores are within 5% of each other. And this is the resulting data frame where ambience and bangerness are equal. So this final step shows tracks where bangerness and ambientness are closely aligned. And I find that the results really make sense for me personally, of course. Uh, and they represent this kind of blend or intersection of these qualities that I appreciate very much in FX Twins music. And I also include a playlist of these tracks for you to judge for yourself. This concludes my small presentation. Again, there are links below to the notebook and all the playlists and everything if you're interested. Uh, thanks for watching.